In this video, we will cover all the fundamental concepts on how to achieve fat loss. First, let's discuss what exactly fat loss is. Well, it is pretty much what the name implies. It refers to a reduction in body fat. More specifically, it is a reduction in subcutaneous adipose tissue, meaning the fat that is stored in a layer underneath the skin. This is achieved primarily via weight loss. When losing weight, we lose mostly fat. However, we also usually lose a little bit of lean mass in the process. This research review found that during weight loss, people typically lose about three quarters fat and about one quarter lean mass when no specific strategies are implemented to try and retain lean mass. The exception to this is for high protein diets, which is something we will discuss soon. While weight loss results in mostly fat loss, it is still a decent proportion of lean mass we are losing. We usually want to retain as much lean mass as possible during weight loss for aesthetic, health, and functional purposes. And if we can retain more lean mass during this process, we will increase the amount of fat that is lost as a proportion of the weight lost. So essentially, the two primary components to maximize fat loss are number one, weight loss, and number two, lean mass retention. Let's now discuss how to achieve each. The number one priority for fat loss is weight loss. For meaningful fat loss to occur, we usually need to lose weight to some degree. It is possible to lose fat without losing weight, but the magnitude is generally going to be quite small. For example, this study compared the effects of resistance training and or a calorie deficit on body composition changes. 40 untrained females were assigned to one of either three protocols for six weeks. One group performed resistance training two to three times per week while attempting to maintain body weight. The second group worked with a dietitian to try and reduce body weight, but with no training protocol. And the third aimed to reduce body weight while also performing resistance training. It was found that as expected, the two groups dieting lost a little body weight, while the maintenance group maintained body weight. Lean mass increased in the two training groups, but the diet only group lost a little bit. However, total fat loss was greater in the two groups in a deficit compared with the training only group. So while weight loss is the most important consideration for fat loss, how do we lose weight? This ultimately comes down to energy balance. In other words, how many calories we consume versus how many we expend. Energy intake is the total amount of calories consumed throughout the day via food and drinks. Energy expenditure is a product of three primary components basal metabolic rate, the thermic effect of food, and physical activity. Physical activity can also be subcategorized into intentional exercise and non-intentional exercise, often referred to as NEAT. For weight loss to occur, we need to consume fewer calories than we expend on average over time. So total energy intake needs to be less than total energy expenditure from all components. So there are two sides to this equation energy intake and energy expenditure. But which one should we prioritize for weight loss? Should we focus on reducing calorie intake via the diet, or should we try to increase energy expenditure via exercise? Well, both can work to some extent, but calorie restriction seems to be more effective than exercise for weight loss. This study compared the effects of diet and or exercise on weight loss. 439 overweight or obese women were assigned to one of either three protocols for one year. One group performed 45 minutes of aerobic exercise five times per week. The second group worked with a dietitian with the aim to reduce body weight by 10%. And the third group implemented both the exercise and diet protocols. It was found that body weight reduced in the exercise only group by about 2%. The diet only group lost about 9%, and the combined group lost the most weight, about 11%. The reason that exercise usually isn't as effective for weight loss is because it doesn't seem to reliably burn as many calories as traditionally thought. As we burn more energy via exercise, we see a down-regulation in other components of energy expenditure. So the net total energy burned is probably not going to be as high as we may think. What this means is that to reliably produce a calorie deficit, limiting calorie intake is most important. It will take a lot of effort to produce a meaningful calorie deficit via exercise alone without changing diet habits at all. That being said, physical activity is not completely useless for weight loss. It can still assist to some extent, it just shouldn't be the main focus for weight loss. 
Moving on to the second half of the fat loss equation, we have lean mass retention. Lean mass refers to basically everything that isn't fat. This is primarily muscle mass, but it also includes bone and organ mass too. This is basically all the good stuff which is important for health and function. So in most cases, we want to limit the amount of lean mass we lose during the weight loss process for aesthetic, health and functional purposes. There are three primary strategies that we can use to improve lean mass retention. The first and by far most important is exercise. Unlike weight loss, exercise is far more important for lean mass adaptations rather than any diet strategy. Basically, any form of exercise during weight loss is going to improve lean mass retention. Even aerobic exercise can mitigate lean mass losses during weight loss. However, resistance training in particular is going to be most effective for building and retaining lean mass. This was seen in this study, which compared the effects of aerobic exercise, resistance training, or no exercise during weight loss on body composition changes. 249 older adults underwent a calorie deficit of around 330 calories per day for 6 months while performing either no exercise, aerobic exercise 4 times per week, or resistance training 4 times per week. It was found that all groups lost significant body weight. However, the resistance training group experienced the least amount of lean mass loss. This also meant that they lost the most fat as a proportion of total weight loss. The second strategy that can help us with lean mass retention is protein intake. A high protein diet in conjunction with exercise can increase the amount of lean mass we retain during weight loss. This meta-regression looked at the influence of protein intake on lean mass retention during weight loss in interventions involving resistance training. It was found that higher protein intakes in conjunction with resistance training tend to enhance lean mass retention during weight loss. When consuming more than around 1.8 grams per kilogram per day, subjects typically experienced slight gains in lean mass during weight loss with further benefits from higher protein intakes. However, we should also be aware that a high protein intake alone isn't all that effective if exercise isn't being performed simultaneously. Rather, protein seems to play more of a complementary role, enhancing the magnitude of muscle growth or retention induced by exercise. For example, this study compared the effects of a higher versus lower protein intake with or without exercise on body composition changes during weight loss. 100 overweight or obese adults followed a calorie-restricted diet for 10 weeks. One group consumed a lower protein diet of 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. The second group consumed a higher protein intake of 1.3 grams per kilogram per day. The third group consumed a lower protein intake but performed resistance training three times per week. And the last group consumed a high protein diet plus performed resistance training. It was found that all groups lost significant body weight. Both the diet-only groups approximately maintained fat-free mass. The lower protein resistance training group gained a little fat-free mass, and the best outcomes were seen in the group performing resistance training in combination with the high-protein diet. For some practical recommendations, it is recommended to try and consume a minimum protein intake of 1 gram per kilogram of body weight per day for the purposes of fat loss. Ideally, we would try and consume more than 1.5 grams per kilogram per day to further enhance lean mass retention. And if possible, consuming more than 2 grams per kilogram per day would likely promote small additional benefits if it is feasible. It should also be noted that these numbers are based on average, relatively lean individuals. Here is a table which scales these recommendations based on body fat percentage, and this protein scaling can be applied to both males and females. And the third variable that can influence lean mass retention during weight loss is our rate of weight loss. Losing weight at a slower rate typically results in greater lean mass retention compared with faster weight loss. For example, this study compared the effects of losing weight at two different rates on body composition changes. 24 athletes recruited from the Norwegian Olympic Sports Centre underwent a weight loss phase while performing their regular sport practice as well as resistance training four times per week. Half the athletes lost an average of 4.2 kilograms in 8.5 weeks, while the others lost the same amount of weight in 5.3 weeks. Both groups also consumed a protein intake of 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. 
it was found that a little lean mass was gained in the slower weight loss group, while a small reduction in lean mass was observed in the fast weight loss group, which also meant that the slow weight loss resulted in greater fat loss. Furthermore, this meta-regression aimed to analyse the influence of the magnitude of a calorie deficit on changes in lean mass while performing resistance training. It was found that when entering a deficit of more than around 500 calories per day, lean mass losses are typically observed. Although with deficits of less than 500 calories, we often experience no losses or even small gains in lean mass when resistance training is being performed. And although it is evident that a slower rate of weight loss enhances lean mass retention within the timeframes of the weight loss period, it is unclear if this would result in meaningful body composition differences long term. While a slower rate of weight loss may allow us to retain more lean mass, it also takes longer, which delays the time we are able to enter maintenance calories and therefore provide a superior hypertrophic stimulus. Whereas if we were to lose weight at a faster rate, we would get to our target body weight in a shorter time frame, which means we can get back to maintenance calories sooner and potentially regain any lean mass that we might have sacrificed by getting there faster. So it is unclear at this stage if there is necessarily a long-term physiological advantage to slower weight loss. Independent of the physiological effects, there is another important influence of our rate of weight loss on fat loss, and that is its influence on our ability to adhere to a calorie deficit. A faster rate of weight loss is generally more difficult to adhere to compared with a slower rate of loss. It requires more restriction and greater modification to your habitual diet. It also often comes with greater fatigue levels if the rate of loss is too fast. This can have two potential negative effects for fat loss. First is that we simply fail to adhere to the diet for any meaningful amount of time. And this can inhibit our number one priority, which is to achieve weight loss. Second is that even if we do lose meaningful body weight, we probably have a higher likelihood of weight regain. This is because the diet practices are too far removed from your habitual eating habits, so when it comes to weight maintenance, we haven't necessarily developed sustainable eating habits. So even if there aren't necessarily physiological benefits, I would generally err on the side of a slightly slower rate of weight loss simply for diet adherence and long-term eating behavior development. As a practical recommendation, I would suggest losing weight at a rate that you feel comfortable with. This means a rate that allows you to eat a realistic diet conducive with your lifestyle, that doesn't cause excessive fatigue, and that has some amount of flexibility involved. This rate will differ for each individual based on current body fat, physical activity levels, habitual diet habits, occupation and lifestyle, and personal preferences. As a general rule, losing weight at no more than around 0.5% of body weight per week is a decent starting guideline. Now we have covered all the fundamentals of fat loss. If you were doing these well, other variables don't seem to have much of an impact on fat loss in most typical scenarios. If you were eating in a calorie deficit, losing weight at a reasonable rate, performing resistance training, and consuming a sufficient protein intake, there will be minimal impact of other variables. However, I think it is still worth discussing some of these factors to make sure we aren't putting too much effort into micromanaging these variables. The first of which is carbohydrate and fat intake. These macronutrients make up the rest of calories after protein. So with calories equated, we could either consume a higher fat, lower carbohydrate, or a lower fat, higher carbohydrate diet. However, as long as we are meeting a minimum intake of each for general health and function, the exact proportion of each doesn't seem to impact fat loss to any meaningful extent. For example, this study compared body composition changes during weight loss with three different diets. 62 individuals consumed one of either three calorie-restricted diets for 12 weeks. One was a low-carb, high-fat diet, one was a slightly higher-carb, lower-fat diet, and third was a fairly balanced fat versus carb diet. And in all three cases, protein intake was similar, around 20% of total calories. It was found that all three groups lost weight, with the relative proportion of abdominal fat lost being similar in all cases. So while the proportion of carbohydrate and fat intake of our diet doesn't seem to have a major impact on fat loss, we still probably want to consume a minimum intake of each for general health and function. 
A minimum carbohydrate intake of around 1 gram per kilogram per day is recommended to ensure adequate exercise performance. And a minimum fat intake of around 0.5 grams per kilogram per day is recommended to support general health. The other factor that seems to have little influence on fat loss is meal timing, frequency, and distribution. This refers to how many meals are consumed per day and when they are consumed. If the same total daily calories and macronutrients are consumed, the exact timing, frequency, and distribution of our meals doesn't seem to meaningfully impact fat loss. For example, this study compared the effects of consuming 3 versus 6 meals per day during weight loss for 3 months. It was found that both groups lost a similar amount of body weight with similar proportionate changes in fat mass and fat free mass. Furthermore, this study compared the effects of a normal versus time restricted feeding eating pattern on body composition changes during weight loss while performing resistance training. It was found that both groups lost a similar amount of body weight and fat mass with no significant differences between them. So overall, it is possible that there may be some slight advantages to specific meal timing, frequency and distribution patterns. However, since these findings are inconsistent and small in magnitude, it probably isn't worth putting too much intentional effort into. Instead, I would recommend following an eating pattern that is practical and sustainable for you. In summary, let's recap the fundamentals of fat loss. Fat loss is primarily achieved via weight loss. And weight loss is mostly going to be achieved by limiting calorie intake rather than increasing energy expenditure. Furthermore, we generally want to try and retain as much lean mass as we can during the weight loss process, so the majority of lost weight comes from fat tissue. Exercise, and in particular resistance training, is going to be the most effective strategy to accomplish this. A high protein intake can also complement an exercise routine, resulting in even greater lean mass retention. A slower rate of weight loss also seems to increase lean mass retention, but it is unclear if this would have a net positive effect when considering the long-term effects after the weight loss phase. Although a slower rate of weight loss might help individuals better adhere to a calorie deficit and develop more sustainable diet habits that can assist with weight loss maintenance. Other variables may also have a small impact on fat loss, but not to any meaningful magnitude. The exact proportion of carbohydrates versus fats your diet is composed of doesn't seem to have any major influence. And the exact timing, frequency and distribution of our meals also doesn't seem to be influential enough to give specific recommendations for. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.